There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. With Jesus, even in our darkest moments, the best remains and the very best is yet to be. Corey Ten Boom said that. How many of you know her story? Um, I had heard her name for a long time, maybe the first time when I was in college or so, and I never knew anything about her, never heard her story. And then sometime the past few years, I keep hearing about her autobiography, The Hiding Place. So we're reading it together as a family. It's incredible. So she was a Christian, Dutch watchmaker, and she and her family helped many Jewish people escape from the Nazis during World War II, risking their lives to save the lives of many other others. She was a part of this hub of a massive underground network, helping and hiding Jews. And she was eventually arrested and taken to a concentration camp. She made it out, and she has an incredible story of knowing and sharing the love of Christ, even in the midst of incredible suffering. And she learned that no matter how deep in suffering you go, the triune God of love is with you, and He will one day get you out of that pit, even if it takes until the resurrection. So I want to know that love like she did. It's one thing to like a quote like the one I read. It's another thing to know it as deeply as she did. And I couldn't summarize the point of our text this morning better than what she said. So you can turn with me to Romans chapter 8, the very end of it, verses 35 through 39. And today, uh, being Mother's Day, uh, we love you mothers and we're so grateful uh, for you. And so this is a day when we celebrate the mothers in our lives and the grandmothers. Many of you also are grieving the loss of your mother, and this is a day when the grief freshly washes over you, perhaps, maybe with a mix of grief and thankfulness, maybe just with sorrow. Maybe this is the first year that you've had a Mother's Day without a mother. Some of you are grieving in your longing to be a mother. And so, this text is especially uh, for those of us who are feeling loss even this morning. There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. So we're finishing our series on Romans 8 this morning. Next week we'll begin a series called People for the World, Showing and Sharing the Love of Christ. So part of the idea here is to respond to the wonders of God's love that we've seen in Romans chapter 8 and let it lead us to very intentionally show the love of Christ in our lives, and share it with our words, the message of Jesus. So we want more people to get in on what we've been celebrating here. And this morning, we've come to the last five verses in maybe the greatest chapter in the Bible. So let's read uh, this text and pray. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, we're here now to be convinced afresh of your love for us in Christ and to enjoy being loved by you. So please help us now by the Spirit to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here's the message of this text. Nothing, not even the worst suffering, can separate Christians from the love of Christ. No matter how deep the pit, no matter how dark 
it gets, no matter how painful the trial, God's people are secure in an eternal and unbreakable bond of love. Text works kind of like a funnel. So if you look at it with me, the beginning and end of it, you can see in verses 35 and 39, he says his main point, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. So you see that repeated at the beginning and end. And then working inward from there, he lists things that could lead us to doubt this. So you can see these lists in verses 35 to 36 and 38. And then at the center is an incredible statement. We are more than conquerors in these things through him who loved us. So we're going to follow those three big ideas for our time together, knowing the love of Christ, doubting the love of Christ, and conquering through the love of Christ. So first, knowing the love of Christ. So in verse 35, he asks, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And the answer is obviously no one and nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And then he says it another way in verse 39. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is the point, very clear, nothing can separate Christians from the love of Christ. But do you notice the slight difference in both those statements? Verse 35, he refers to the love of Christ. Verse 39, he refers to the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, God being the Father there. So Paul often does something like this because the love of the Father and the love of Son are inseparable. We could put it this way, the love of God the Father, He is the fountain of all love, and His love flows to us through the love of the Son. So we should never think that the Son loves us and the Father doesn't, or that the Father doesn't, but He only does because the Son gets Him to love us through His loving sacrifice on the cross. No. The Father is the fountain of all love flowing to us through the love of Christ. So when you see the love of Christ, you are seeing also the love of the Father expressed through Him. So this is the culmination now and the summary of everything we've seen in Romans 8. Up to this point in Romans 8, we've seen Paul unfold the rich and deep doctrines of the gospel, all these wondrous realities that are true of Christians. We've been seeing that when we become a Christian— We have no idea just how amazing the reality is that we've just walked into. So, I've been saying in different ways throughout this series that um, this is like so many great stories and movies. People are just minding their own business, going about their life, and then they stumble upon some gateway to some new reality that they had no idea was there and is incredible and is filled with endless exploration. So Peter and Susan, Edmund and Lucy walk through the wardrobe into Narnia, that wonder world. Harry Potter enters a hidden platform and takes the express train to Hogwarts. Even the new Mario movie. Mario and Luigi, plumbers in New York City, minding their own business, trying to make a living, and then they stumble upon the opening of a green water pipe, and they're sucked into it, and shot out into the mushroom kingdom, this wonderful world to explore. Romans 8 is showing us that that's what it's like most often to become a Christian. You're minding your own business, and then through various circumstances, you hear the gospel of Jesus, maybe after a long time of resisting and rejecting, and then God opens your heart to it, and you find yourself trusting Him. And then you've stepped into a new reality, and you actually still have no idea just how amazing this is. In Romans 8 is is this pathway we can follow to explore just how incredible this reality is that we've gotten into. And so if you're a new believer, I encourage you to continue to read Romans 8 and study it as your entryway into the rest of the Bible. If you have a friend who has recently become a Christian or has not yet really explored this wonder world, walk them through Romans 8 together. Romans 8 is showing us that when you trust Christ, you, yes, are trusting Him for the forgiveness of your sins and for eternal life. The two things that we most often make very clear at the beginning of a Christian life, that that's true of you. But Romans 8 also shows us you start learning what else happened to you. God gave you a new heart. He's removed all the condemnation for your sins forever. 
He set you free from the enslaving, addicting, compulsive power of sin. He's adopted you into his family. He's promised you the resurrection of the body, even as already now you have a resurrected life within you. He's promised to give you, as your inheritance, the renewal of creation and all things. Although you chose to trust in Christ, you find out that He chose you first, and He predestined you to become like Jesus, not only in a resurrection body, but in your character. And He's working everything together for your good. And now, everything's coming to a culmination and a summary at the end here. This all shows us the eternal and unstoppable love of Christ. He's done all this for us, and nothing can separate us from His love. So, do you know the love of Christ like this? Or do you know the love of Christ, but you don't connect it to all these wonderful realities and doctrinal truths? Or do you know doctrine, and you could have explained all these realities way better than I could these past few months, but you, you feel chilly toward Christ and you don't see His love coming through all of this. Do you realize that there was never a time when God didn't love His people? Do you know what God was doing before the creation of the world? He was loving Father, Son, and Spirit in eternal fellowship of love and loving His people. That's why John says God is love. And this triune God of love was loving you. You were already on His heart from eternity past. He chose you from eternity past and set His heart on you. That's why you've come to Christ. I haven't read anyone that's helped me grasp this more than Thomas Goodwin, who I know I've quoted a bunch recently. I'll take a break. Listen to this. He has loved you ever since He loved Himself. There is not a moment in which He has not loved us and had His thought upon us. God will never stop loving you if you are in Christ because in a sense He never began. He has always loved you. You have never had a moment of your life without this eternal love fixed on you. And there's nothing you can do to separate that love from you. The triune God of love loved us with the fullness of love from eternity past. I'm just aware right now what I've thought often through the week. Um, what, what kind of it, I don't know how to put this, we really can't hardly talk about the love of Christ and get anywhere close to the reality, right? So I'm just going to do what I can, just unfold this for you for what it's worth. God has to make His love known to us by the Spirit. Lord, do it. But we often do not know this like we could. So second, doubting the love of Christ. So Paul gives a couple lists here. The point of both lists is that nothing can separate us from Christ's love, but he's bringing all these things up because the things he mentions in these lists are very real challenges to us. They are very real things in life that provide the context for you and I to doubt his love and his kindness toward us. So the first list is in verse 35. He lists seven different kinds of suffering here. Do you see them? Tribulation is the first one, which really refers to all sorts of hardship, afflictions, and troubles. And then distress, persecution, which refers to specific hardships given to Christians because they follow Jesus. Famine, which was an unbearable tragedy in the first century as it is in other places in the world. Nakedness, danger, the sword. These are all the kinds of suffering that can come into a Christian's life. They all came into Paul's life he was imprisoned, beaten, lashed, stoned, went hungry. This list is coming from his own experience. You can read it in 2 Corinthians 11 and 12. And then he quotes from Psalm 44 here in verse 36. This psalm is about God's people who are faithful to him 
So this remnant of God's people in the Old Testament who's faithful to him, and yet they are still suffering terribly, it seems even because they're faithful. So it says, for your sake, they're saying this in prayer, for your sake, God, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. So by listing these things, from Paul's own experience even, and then quoting this from Psalm 44, Paul is saying that suffering is nothing new for God's people. If you experience these tragedies, this is not unique, this is typical. So we need to remember this today. Christians in the West can often feel like things have been okay, but they're getting worse. Seems like Christians are being socially marginalized, and perhaps persecution will come. Well, if it does, let's remember that this has been typical for God's people throughout history. It's not necessarily that the world is getting worse, and we know, therefore, that Jesus is going to return in the next few years or something. Maybe. But the kinds of things that some of us might be experiencing now or soon are typical of God's people throughout history. Read Voice of the Martyrs. Read persecution.com. Not just to learn, but then to pray for the brothers and sisters who are suffering these things. And we can make our own lists. You get diagnosed with cancer. Your child has passed away. Your friend has a life-altering injury. You have a maddeningly frustrating job. You're in a season in life where you feel like you don't have purpose and you're not useful. Someone's bullying you. No one seems to care. You feel pressure at school or work to affirm our culture's gender and sexual revolution. revolution. All these pressures and trials can eventually make us feel like as they squeeze in us, they can make us feel like God doesn't love us. Why is this all happening to me? Paul gives a second list in verse 28. I'm sure that Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation can separate us from the love of God. He's listing everything he can think of that may cause us to doubt that God loves us or that we think can separate us from God's love. Death and life, angels and demons, problems in life now, problems to come, height, depth, anything. And I think if we could get to the bottom of this, the reason why so many of these things lead us to doubt God's love is because of an assumption. It's the assumption that if God loves us, He wouldn't give us these kinds of trials, right? If God loved me, He would make my life easier. So when hard things happen to us, we tend to doubt God's goodness and love. We think it means he doesn't love us, but it's not true. Just the opposite. In fact, in many of these circumstances, just think about a parent with a child. So often, my boys have not understood why we have them do certain things. It's hard. It's challenging. But over time, they're learning that we can even bring hard things into their life for their good. Because we love them. It's for their growth. It's a consequence to teach them. Hebrews 12 says that God is like a father to his people, and there is no child who's loved that's without discipline. He disciplines those whom he loves. So it's understandable to have doubts of God's love at times. We don't need to feel ashamed. We don't need to ignore that. Paul's addressing this in the culmination of the chapter because he knows it's really a struggle. He knows Christians sometimes do doubt that God loves them. Our suffering makes us feel like he doesn't care, but we don't need to doubt it. We can have confidence that God loves us even through suffering. One way to do this, to just take this text and let it kind of be brought to bear in your suffering now or in days to come, is to ask in every tragedy or any particular tragedy this question, does this particularly painful experience separate me from Christ's love? Can this separate me from it. Maybe just even say that out loud in the midst of your trial. Drew, this thing that's happening to you, can this separate you from the love of Christ? Is this evidence that he doesn't love you? And the answer to that question is always, in every circumstance, no. Nothing can separate you from his love. 
So let me summarize it like this. In every hard circumstance in life, no exceptions, God's people can know two things. This is really hard, and Jesus still loves me. But there's more to say, because while Paul lists all these realities that can lead us to doubt God's love, his alternative here is not just not doubting. It's not just don't doubt, stop doubting. No, the whole tone here is confidence. Not only can nothing separate us from Christ's love, we are actually, he says, more than conquerors in and through these things. So this is the third point here, conquering through the love of Christ. It's verse 37, right at the heart and center of this text. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Now, that is counterintuitive. I mean, it sounds amazing at first, and then after a few moments, you think about it, and you think, what? At least I did. Paul just listed all sorts of ways that suffering can conquer us. He includes the sword and death. Here. And yet he says that in all these things that conquer us, we are more than conquerors. Well, that's interesting. He must mean that there is a greater kind of conquering than just overcoming sickness and suffering. What is it? Well, here's what it's not conquering does not mean you stop suffering. He's not saying you suffer, but you can conquer this. You will overcome this sickness. You will beat this disease. No, that's not the hope of this text. It's not the hope of the New Testament, not in this life. That's the health and wealth gospel of so many TV preachers, and it's not true. The Lord may have you beat this disease, or better, He he would defeat it for your good in this life. And we can ask Him to do that, and we should, and He loves to do that. But he doesn't promise it in this life. No, the conquering here is not that. The conquering here is not immediate relief from suffering. There's some sense in which it is in our very experience of suffering that we conquer. And the key is the last part of that verse. Do you see it? In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So here's my best shot at understanding this. I've been meeting with a handful of men in our church to grow and studying and teaching the Bible, and they've helped me here this week as we were looking at this text. So my best shot to conquer is to hold fast to Jesus, knowing that He holds fast to us. To conquer is to hold fast to Jesus, knowing that He holds fast to us. We conquer when we trust in Jesus, even in the midst of all these reasons to doubt his love. We keep holding on and we don't give up because we know that in all these sufferings, he will not let us go. He will keep holding us fast, even if it's his grip stays tight right through the doorway of death into his presence. So for anyone who's gone through a storm of suffering, you know that this is no small thing to do. To simply hold on to Jesus in the midst of suffering can be the hardest thing you will ever do in your life. It is heroic. It is courageous to stand in the midst of a dark storm and trial and know that there is still a sun shining behind those dark clouds. Clinging to Jesus is conquering. And we do this because he's the one who clings to us. We hold him fast because he holds fast to us. Or to put it even more simply, knowing that Jesus loves you, even in the midst of the hardest trial you've ever faced, knowing that Jesus loves you, even when it feels like he doesn't, that's conquering. That's it. So when you face your next trial, the main thing to say is not, I am going to beat this suffering. I'm going to beat this disease. I'm going to beat this cancer. Oh, that is the hope. And we long for it and we pray for it. And we fight. The main thing to say, though, is whether or not this trial beats me down and takes my life, 
I will not let go of Jesus because he's not going to let go of me. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So how do we respond? A few implications. First, continue to learn the love of Christ. Whenever your view or my view of Christ's love feels small, be suspicious of it. If you think Christ's love doesn't seem weighty, assume that in that moment that you have a small view of Christ's love, assume that the problem is not Christ's love, assume that it's you. But don't let that discourage you. Don't just feel bad about that. Instead, view it as an opportunity because it means you have an opportunity to step into the wonders of God's love even more. Return to Romans 8. Read the Gospel of John. Ask God to open your eyes to see His love more clearly. Second, settle this as your identity. Don't just learn the love of Christ, but embrace being loved by Christ as your identity. If you are in Christ by faith, you are someone who is eternally and irrevocably loved by Christ. This is now who you are. It struck me a few years ago when I was reading Romans. In fact, just flip back if you have your Bible open a few pages to the first chapter. There's a statement here that I read I don't know how many times, and I hardly ever paid any attention to it. It seemed to be a passing statement to me. Paul's just addressing his readers. He's saying who they are. But look what he says, verse 7 of chapter 1. To those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. That is not a throwaway statement. That is a carefully chosen statement of identity. That's who you are if you're a Christian. You are those who are in Indiana loved by God. Christians are those who are loved by God. What does that mean? Well, to find out, read the rest of the book of Romans. The rest of Romans is in many ways just an unpacking of the wonder of what I thought was a passing statement, those who are loved by God. In the moments of your deepest distress, if you can't find any words to say or what to pray, you can say these three words, I am loved. Jesus loves me. You may become disillusioned by the betrayal of a friend or the hypocrisy of someone whom you looked up to and trusted. Your whole world may be thrown into chaos. Even then, your identity hasn't changed. You are loved. When I've tucked my boys in, this has been good for me to do for my own self. I've often just asked them simple questions to reinforce this. Do you know that I love you? Yes. Who else loves you? Mommy. Who loves you most? God. I need that reminder. And to be clear... You are loved by God whether or not you feel like it. Being loved is not conditioned upon feeling loved. Whether or not you feel it, it's there. This is your identity. Third, don't lose sight of God's love. In all your efforts to grow as a Christian, don't lose sight of God's love as if it's just one thing among, among many that you learn and then you move on for, move on from. Don't push it to the periphery. When you read Scripture, remember that you are hearing the words from this God of love. He's given us the Bible to convince us of this. It's why it's here. When you hear a sermon from God's Word, receive it as in the context of God's love for you. I still remember one of my favorite comments um, from someone after a sermon. I don't know, maybe eight years ago, right here. Someone just came up to me and said, I feel so loved by God right now. I thought, well, that's the goal. That's what we're going for in when we gather, enjoying being loved by God and loving Him back. And so when we receive this love, it's actually what we need in order to change in life and to live a more obedient life to Jesus and to become like Him. So forth, respond with love and obedience. God is love. We've rejected the God of love. It's why we experience such profound disconnection and disillusion. But Jesus came to reconvince us of the love of God. He lived a perfect life of love. 
He died on the cross as a cosmic act of self-sacrificial love. He gave his life for us, then he rose again, and he's now inviting us back, and he's calling us to receive his love. If you have not yet come to Christ to receive his love, he's calling you to do that now. Receive his love. And if you still have doubts, work through them. I'd love to talk to you. If you have a Christian friend, they'd love to talk to you. There's resources to help you work through even really significant intellectual barriers you may have, but receive his love. And when we receive his love, this leads us to live a different life, to respond with love and obedience. It's always how it works. God loves us, and that love transforms us to love him back. And Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. So if you want to love God, what do you do? You get convinced that he loves you, and you respond. You let his love kindle your love for him. If you want to obey, if you want to fight sin, if you want to break that sinful addiction, if you want to grow in in Christian maturity, how do you do it? Well, you need to love God. And how do you love God? You receive His love for you. God loves us. We receive that love and love Him back. And if we love Him, we'll obey His commands. And this is how we cultivate a gospel culture of loving among us as a church. We just keep receiving God's love and then so enjoying it that we can't help but reflect that back to one another and setting the tone of our church. Finally, let's spread the love of Christ. If you have been filled up with Christ's love from this series in Romans 8, here's one very clear way to respond. Share this love with someone else who needs to get in on it and pray that God would open their hearts. We want to spread God's love, not just in the way we treat people, but also in verbally speaking the love of Christ. The realities of Romans 8 cannot be understood truly and fully without words, without teaching, without sharing. And so the love of Christ is what we bring to people. We tell people the message of God's love for them in Christ, and we call them to receive that love. And the love of Christ is what gives us confidence to do it. Because we all know what's one of the biggest barriers to sharing the gospel. If you're a Christian, you have people that in your life you'd love to know the love of Christ like this. What's a big barrier? You fear rejection. You fear them not liking you. Well, rejection is one of those things that cannot separate you from the love of Christ. So, What we need is not just to bring the message of Jesus, but we need to be filled with the love of Christ, knowing that no matter how this person responds, this message for their good that I'm sharing out of love, however they respond, will not threaten the love of Christ for me. I'm still filled up. I'm still secure. I'm still someone who's loved by God. In other words, we don't just have the message of Jesus' love to share. It is itself the motivation to share. So we share the gospel because we know God loves us, we know God loves them, we love them, and we do not need them to love us because we know God loves us and we know God loves them. So this will be our next series, which starts next week, People for the World, Showing and Sharing the Love of Christ. We want to take the gospel we've enjoyed in Romans 8 and continue to share it with everyone else. And so just to return to where we began here, there is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. Even with Jesus, even in our darkest moments, the best remains and the very best is yet to be. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your eternal and overflowing and abounding love and kindness to us in Jesus. We pray that in the coming minutes and hours, days, weeks, years, and eternity, you would continue to plunge us deeper into our experience of this love. Help us have a felt sense of your love in the moments when we feel furthest away from you. And we pray that you would do all the things that you love to do in transforming us by the love. In Jesus' name, amen.